Welcome to day two of the Eurographics uh, Symposium on Rendering. Uh, try to. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with the first time around, uh, and my hope uh, is that the audio is working this time. Um, so uh, with no further ado, uh, so today we're going to start the sessions with a keynote from Jan Kautz. Uh, and as a reminder, for, for those of you, um, we're going to follow the same approach that we followed yesterday for Q&A after the keynote. Uh, so it'll be based on Rocket Chat. Uh, there's a dedicated channel for the keynote, uh, and you can sign up for the Rocket Chat system on the EGSR website if you have not already. Um, so please, um, if you have questions and comments, um, you know, type them in during the keynote. You don't have to wait until afterwards. Uh, and then uh, I will moderate those and we'll turn that into Q&A with Jan after the, uh, after the keynote has finished. Um, so we're very fortunate to have Jan joining us today. Uh, he's currently the Vice President of, uh, perception research, of Learning and Perception Research at NVIDIA, um, but he has a long history with EGSR and he's very well known in the community. I count 15 papers for, um, going back to 1998 uh, that Jan has been involved with. Um, of course, some of those were back when this was the Eurographics Symposium on rendering, or sorry, the Eurographics Workshop on rendering uh, before it was a symposium. Uh, his research interests span quite widely, uh, originally mostly focused on rendering and image synthesis, uh, lighting and shadows and VRDFs and all these things, um, but have, have broadened into computer vision and perception, uh, largely driven by deep learning. Um, he's done some particularly interesting work on generative models for image synthesis uh, using GANs to generate images, which, which have shown some quite remarkable results. So he has a very broad, uh, broad perspective on, on imaging and rendering, and I uh, very much look forward to seeing what he has to say today. Uh, over to the keynote. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be talking about our work on generative models for image synthesis. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the keynote here at this year's uh, EGSR. EGSR really holds a special place in my heart. EGSR, or rather, the Eurographics Workshop on Rendering, as it was called then, is when my research career really started. I published uh, my very first paper here in 1998. It was joint work with Wolfgang Heydrich, Philip Suselik, and Hans-Peter Seidel. I'm sure those are the names you all recognize. And then the following year in 1999, I published my first paper here as the main author together with Mike McCool. And, and this was also the first conference I ever attended in person. It, it took place in Granada in Spain that year, uh, which is a really great uh, experience. I'm also yeah, happy to be back at this time because really <clears throat> my research you know, has changed over time, but in, in some sense it's back now uh, where it began. So originally I worked you know, a lot on real-time rendering. Then over the years I moved more towards computational photography and then when I joined NVIDIA I moved more towards working on computer vision uh, problems. This also meant that I was more getting more involved with AI but then more recently, we've been using AI for image synthesis. And this is you know, sort of going back to where I started. <clears throat> and this is what I will be talking about uh, to you today. So you all know the traditional graphics pipeline, right? Um, we have to create meshes and then assign materials and then possibly animate you know, those meshes and we can finally render them. And, and this is you know, clearly very successful, right? Games use it, media entertainment, simulation, and so forth, right? So it's been sort of the standard pipeline that everybody uses. At the same time, it, it is labor intensive and, and some things are difficult to do. Um, imagine you, know, you want uh, the suit you know, or, or this, this character <clears throat> to be a person. How would you do that, right? You can imagine it. But then how would you actually do that if you were to model it? It would be really difficult to model, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's one of those things where you know, maybe AI can be used uh, to help or enable um, creators. So the question that I would like to answer today is, or at least help answer, can we learn to synthesize images or image data? And, and the reason why we might want to do this, and we might want to do this you know, to create just new data or as an artistic tool um, and so forth. 
So <clears throat> we're going to show uh, we're going to show some progress um, that we've made over the last few years um, on neural image and video synthesis, and we're going to do this by learning uh, from data in either unsupervised or supervised fashion. So yeah, as I mentioned, use cases, yeah, content creation is is, is a big one, um, and then generation of more training data is is another use case uh, that we had in mind when we started working on this. There's sort of a third use case that I implied at the very beginning, and that is, yeah, do we need a traditional graphics pipeline or can we replace it uh, with AI? And uh, I don't know if we can if we can answer this at this point, but this is you know why we're interested in, in this uh, research. So much of my talk today um, centers around generative adversarial networks, or GANs for short. So I'm sure many of you have heard of them, but I'd like to give you sort of a quick overview of, of what they are. So a GAN it consists of two neural networks. Uh, one is the so-called generator that takes you know, a latent vector z, so just a vector of numbers, and uses it to synthesize an image. And then there's a discriminator, which sort of the judge, which will, you know, try and learn to distinguish generated images from real images in your training data. So your training data just consists of a set of images, such as, you know, say, driving images, right? So now we have two yeah, neural networks, the generator and the discriminator. They're not trained at the beginning. So initially, the generator will just spit out you know, random things, right? They don't look like images. And the discriminator will have uh, we'll need to learn whether this is a real image or a synthesized image. The discriminator has the advantage it will see from time to time real images and sort of learn what a real image should look like. And then you train them in a ping pong fashion and surprisingly you can actually train both of them you know, to convergence and then the generator will be able to generate images that are similar but not identical to the images in your training set. And the discriminator will have a hard time distinguishing them. And this was initially proposed by Goodfellow in 2014, but much progress has been achieved over the last uh, you know, years. So these are examples of faces being synthesized by Stalgan 2, uh, which is work that was done at, at NVIDIA as well, and published this here at CBPR. And as you can tell, you, yeah, these are realistic looking faces, right? You can't tell them apart um, from photographs. So it's quite, it's quite remarkable. Now, GANs, yeah, like this, the, the results are phenomenal. However, just a pure GAN, you don't have a lot of control. The only control you have is this latent vector Z. So we would like to instill a bit more control in them and condition them on some user input. The standard way of doing this is through so-called conditional GANs. So conditional GAN doesn't take this latent vector Z as input. But yeah, something else, for instance, another image on which you want to condition the output of the generator. So for instance, yeah, it could be that you want to translate you know, a nighttime image to a daytime image, and your generator would then be conditioned on the nighttime image to output you know, a daytime image. Otherwise, yeah, it's very similar to, to a traditional GAN, right? It's really just the input um, is different. So now the question is, yeah, how do we enable sort of imagination abilities? So given yeah, an input image, how do we learn this mapping um, to another domain? Say, you know, I'm conditioning it on a daytime image and it would, or a summer image, and I would like to um, output a rainy day image. How do I do this? And this is actually an example of, of uh, one of our methods where we learned how to translate from sunny images uh, to rainy images. And there's actually, yeah, in some way, lots of use cases for sort of this conditioning on an image and output another image in, in a different domain. If you think of sort of blurry to sharp or low res to high res and image to painting, like all of those are actually yeah, image to image translation um, tasks. The more, yeah, GANs are more well known for uh, doing things like semantic images to real images or daytime to nighttime, summer to winter and so forth. And those are the ones that I'm focusing on um, today. Then there's a big difference between sort of the methods that, that I'll present to, to you today. Some of them are supervised methods, meaning there's a training set uh, that is paired. So I might have you know, a data set of shoes with 
represented as edges only and then the real shoes as well and they're paired because I have corresponding images right now this works yeah for, for the shoe case because I can yeah synthesize um, them myself for other use cases such as translating daytime to nighttime that's difficult right because I will never be able to get paired images between daytime at nighttime there will always be some differences even if I put the camera in the same place try and make sure that nothing's moved well some things will have moved right the leaves might have blown yeah, a little bit a car might have moved and so forth so for some use cases it's actually impossible to get paired training data so you really want to look for methods um, that don't need you know paired data and finally there's there's another way to distinguish you know, the methods uh, that I'm presenting today some of them are, are unimodal so I can condition you know, on an input image such as you know, a dog and then when I output a cat image and some of them will all put you know, deterministically exactly one cat image other methods will be able to output sort of a, a variety of cats because it knows or it's realized from the training set that there's not just one type of cat but different types of cats so it's multimodal in its output and these are the methods that, that I'll uh, present today and I'll, I'll um, try to explain you know, what, what each of them uh, does and how they work. So the first one um, I'd like to show, and that's sort of the closest in, in, in some way, uh, as you'll see, <coughs> to um, using AI for, for rendering uh, graphics. So we call it Pixabix uh, HD. Um, so the task here is given a semantic label map, can I output a realistic image that corresponds to my labels? So there's labels such as you know, sidewalk, street, cars, buildings, pedestrians, trees, and so forth, right? Each color uh, has a meaning, and that's given to the network. And can we learn to output you know, realistic looking images? So our work is, is based on uh, Philip Isola's uh, Pix to Pix work, which really is just a conditional. Again, so the input here is a semantic label map, and the goal is to output realistic images. The only difference to our sort of standard conditional GAN that I um, told you about before is that the discriminator now sees the label map as well. And that is, yeah, to enable the discriminator to actually judge whether the labels correspond um, to the output synthesized image. Now, what, what we added <coughs> to it is, is uh, the following. So one of the main additions is that we wanted to make it multimodal, the output. So after we, we've trained um, the network, we extract instance pooled feature maps, meaning yeah, I'm looking sort of underneath the label road, um, are there different types of features, and I try to cluster them. That enables me to figure things out like there's cobblestone cluster and there might be sort of a regular road cluster and so forth and we do this for all um, types of instances and then during inferencing i can pick sort of a cluster center and then decide which one i want right do i want the cobblestone cluster or do i want you know, the, the regular road cluster and i feed this into the network when i synthesize so that allows me to make it multimodal then we do use some additional um, sort of insights one is we do use a course to find generator, which means we initially train a network or generator um, that's lower resolution and we train it fully to convergence. And then we add more layers at either end to make it high resolution and that, that helps with convergence. We also use a multi-scale discriminator, meaning we don't just look at you know, single scale but at multiple scales, also commonly used nowadays. And we, used, we, we also use a Rust Objective, also sometimes called a VGG loss. Um, in this case, it's not in the VGG space, but rather um, in the discriminator space. So we don't look just at pixels, but also at features in the discriminator space and see if they match, which also helps. So here, here are some results. On the top right in the corner, you can see some label maps, or you can see the label map that, that's used here. Then I cycle through different um, clusters to show you different results. So if you look at the road, you can see this cobblestone and then different type of pavement. And then for the cars, you can see it cycles through different uh, colors for the car. So you can see that the network outputs 
you know, it in a multimodal manner. And here I'm doing some label changes. So, you know, uh, what, what I do is I, the background where you have trees changes to buildings and it changes back to trees and then we make the sky to be trees as well. Here we have buildings now, back to trees, the sky is trees as well and so forth. And every time it manages to synthesize something um, that's reasonably realistic. <clears throat> now, we've yeah, then later on extended this uh, to the video case. So now the task is, can I take a label map that is temporal, so I have a sequence of label maps, and can I translate this into a moving, uh, sorry, into a movie? And I'll yeah, show you what, what our first attempt looked like. We just used pix to pix HD and ran it on every frame of the label map. And this is what you get. Not surprising, right? It's flickering a lot. And that's because the network was never trained for temporal coherence, right? It's only ever looked at single images. And if you stop, every single image looks somewhat reasonable, right? If I stop at different places, yeah. A single image looks fine, but of course, temporally, it does not look great. Now, what we did to fix this, we extended our Pixapix HD work uh, to the temporal domain, but in some sense, it's very similar still. So we use the sequential generator. So as input now, we didn't just use a single label map, but a sequence um, of label maps. We also use the past images um, uh, as additional input. We also create optical flow for the past images that we've synthesized, and we forward warp the current frame to the next frame. So we know what it might look like in the future, right? And we also have a network that outputs what the next frame yeah, might look like given all the labels. And then we fuse those two predictions for our final output. So that helps with temporal stability. In addition, we extended our multi-scale discriminators, not to be just image discriminators, but also to be video discriminators. So we do sort of a temporal discrimination as well, in, instead of just a you know, spatial um, discriminator. That, that's helpful. We um, do this at multiple scales, right? So sort of different sort of time uh, scales. And then where we had, where we had the, the, the spatially progressive training, we make it now spatially temporarily progressive. Uh, so we train sort of a smaller uh, network first at you know, a given temporal resolution. And then we upsample you know, the spatial resolution and then we upsample um, the temporal resolution and we ping pong between you know, spatial and temporal um, increase in, in resolution. And that helps um, again as well. So what does this look like? <clears throat> so this is again, input label map, and this is the output. Now you can see it's much more temporally coherent. It's fairly realistic. I wouldn't say it's totally realistic. And you can see over time, yeah, you know, while while it's temporally consistent, over time sometimes things drift a little bit. So the color of a car, for instance, might drift a little bit over over time. But overall, yeah, much improved, right? And we can apply it to other things, not just cars. So we here we have edges uh, to images. And again, we can use, uh, we can make it multimodal uh, as before. So we have yeah, different hair colors, for instance. And you know, we can have different types of input. So here we have sort of a skeleton of the person. And then we, we, we learn how to synthesize a video of a person dancing. So th this is not the training set. This is run on, on, on a newly unseen training uh, dancing sequence. And now this is where, where yeah, it, it meets graphics because you can actually make this interactive. So we made a demo, I think it was at NeurIPS uh, last year or the year before, where we gave user control uh, with a steering wheel, which then we used yeah, for rendering labels using just a standard graphics engine. So it doesn't output you know, RGB pixel values, but rather labels which we then feed into our network to turn those labels 
into um, an RGB image. And then, yeah, we show that. So we are able to interactively drive around you know, a city um, and then we convert this to real looking images just using labels from a game engine. And this is um, what it looks like. So on the left, you have the label map. On the right, you have the rendering. And it's interactive, so the user you know, can drive around. And again, it, it looks very fairly fairly realistic. Now, you can see it, again, they sort of drift in the distance over time. That's also because the labels sort of jump in. Um, you know, there's a level of detail rendering in this. In this in the, but overall, yeah, it, it's quite good, uh, I would say, even though yeah, it doesn't have a lot of information. Like if you look at, um, so if you go back, if you look at the buildings, right? Sorry, it seems uh, here. If you look at the buildings, it doesn't have a lot of information, right? It doesn't actually know where the windows are or any of these things. So the network needs to hallucinate where windows might be and keep it temporarily consistent, which is a tricky thing. That's why you sometimes see a, a little bit of, yeah, drift, especially in the windows, because you know, we don't give it a lot of in additional information that it could leverage. Overall, though, uh, I think it's you know, uh, an interesting way of synthesizing um, images in real time. This was actually a real time demo, or at least you know, around 15 frames per second at the time. Right, so this was um, yeah, turning label maps into images. And we had sort of uh, another follow-up work, uh, Gauguin, or oh, really it was called Semantic Image Synthesis, which basically uh, adaptive formalization, but we dubbed it um, Gauguin. And it was done in, in my team. And I'll, I'll, show you, <clears throat> I'll show you a demo of this. So here we can paint live um, different things. And then uh, the application will directly synthesize what you're drawing. So if I'm drawing you know, a rock, filling it in, then on the right side, you can see the image synthesized you know, in real time. So you have direct feedback of what you're drawing. And this is trained on just a large data set of landscapes. And it's multimodal. I can go through different styles. So I can do you know, daytime, nighttime, sunny, cloudy, and so forth. I'm gonna add some sand here. Make it into gravel, switch again the times around. Do one more example. <clears throat> and, it, and it's quite interesting to see what the network actually learns. So we have grass in the front, a hill in the back. Now we're going to add a tree. second we're going to add a little pond or actually we're going to do snow first sorry and you can see that then we're exploring well if there's snow in the back in the foreground there probably is also snow yeah in the background as well so it puts snow in the mountain as well now going back to grass different styles now we're going to add a little pond underneath now there's something interesting here, and that is the network has actually learned that there should be a reflection in this little pond, right? So you could see the tree stem being reflected um, in this pond, which is quite quite remarkable. Nobody ever taught it, or or here, for example, right? Uh, let me go back. Sorry, you can you see reflection in the pond here, and in a second down here, you can see reflection yeah, in this body of water, right? We didn't explicitly tell it, but it learned that it should do this, which is quite uh, something. Now the architecture for this is actually quite different than the previous ones. You might think that it's you know, sort of the same idea where you have the never conditioned on the labels and it outputs an image. It's different here. The generator takes us input um, the style. So that's the actual input at the lower, lowest resolution of the generator uh, on the input side. Then the label map we feed in through these spade uh, ResNet blocks, 
<clears throat> and I'll explain what those are. But otherwise, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, then we, we have a discriminator on the other end to tell apart whether it's real or fake, the image that's being synthesized. Now, th these uh, spade blocks are sort of like a, a residual network block, except that um, we have the label maps that are being fed into these spade layers. And these spade layers are really quite interesting. So they're spatially adaptive denormalization layers. So they're similar to a batch norm layer. So a batch norm layer in a network basically normalizes the features uh, by their mean and center deviation and then scales them with a learned parameter. We don't learn yeah, sort of one parameter here, but rather the label map comes in, uh, yeah, some convolutions are run on it, then it outputs a tensor of um, gammas and betas that we yeah, multiply and add to the normalized um, batch norm. And that's you know, really how we give the, this information to the network. So we, we take the features that, that have been normalized by batch norm and we scale and bias them through learned parameters that are determined by the semantic map. And that works yeah, very, very well. And you can play with this uh, yourself if you go to this website. Uh, it's, it's an interactive application. It doesn't do the real-time inferencing uh, just because it runs on a web server. Uh, so you have to yeah, click whenever you want to inference an image. But, but it's yeah, very soothing. I recommend uh, trying it. And once you try it, it's easy to, to spend an hour um, painting things. So these are some that I did um, a while ago. And again, as you can note here, so there's a lake, right? And it learns that there should be a reflection inside the lake. What's interesting is that it learned that there's a reflection, but it doesn't actually manage to reflect exactly that mountain, right? It, it reflects something like this mountain, but not exactly this mountain. It's reasonable though, right? It, it does a reasonable good job. If, if you look at it, you might not notice that it's not an exact reflection, but it, overall the impression is, yeah, it's quite good. It looks yeah, very realistic. Here's some more paintings, yeah, beach scene. Another scene with a reflection, and again, it does a yeah, quite a good job at, at reflecting the environment. And of course, we can do other things besides um, landscapes. Sorry, there, there are some more landscapes here. This is to show how it works when you have ground truth. So ground truth here means we take an image, we uh, run a semantic segmentation network on it, which gives us the labels, and then we feed those labels through our model and see what the outcome of the model is uh, compared to the ground truth. And you can see, yeah, it's similar, right? In this case, uh, it's a bit different here. Yeah, it's essentially, yeah, the input, not quite, but but very, very similar. And, and here even more, right? It basically is exactly the input um, at different times of day, but very similar. And down here as well, right? It's very similar to the output. It's very similar to the input image, except, yeah, at different uh, times of day or, or times of the year because we can vary the style and here now we can do other things besides um, landscape so this is uh, interior scenes they're, they're a bit more difficult um, but you know they, they, they look at first at first glance that they, they look okay if you look more detail you can see it's not quite as good as as the landscapes and we can do yeah faces as well if you are able to draw very good labels um, then, then you can output uh, faces as well, of course. Right, so all of this so far was trained in a supervised fashion, right? We made the assumption that we have labels as well as the corresponding RGB realistic images, which I think is a yeah, reasonable assumption for that particular use case. Now, as I explained, for other use cases, you might not be able to have paired training data, right? For this case where you want to translate daytime to nighttime or sunny to rainy, I, I can't actually do this, right? So how do we deal with unsupervised training data? And unsupervised here means I have two training sets that are similar, just not identical in paired. So I have you know, sort of a daytime one in this particular case that was captured while driving around. And then I have a nighttime one that was also captured while driving around in a similar area. So they're similar, but not identical. 
So now my task is to learn a translation from this daytime to nighttime. I could say, well, why don't I just train with you know, the daytime images, my conditional input, and the nighttime images as my training set for my, yeah, for my GAN. And somehow, yeah, the network will learn something, right? The problem is it doesn't know that it's supposed to output something that corresponds to your input image, right? It's just conditioned on the input image, right? It uses it as information to seed what it generates. But as long as it generates nighttime images, the discriminator will say, yep, yeah, they look like nighttime images, but we haven't asked it to create nighttime images that actually correspond to the layout of the daytime image, right? So you can output a completely different nighttime image and the discriminator wouldn't know any better because it looks like a nighttime image, just not like the daytime image. And this is what you can see here, right? Going from a daytime image to a nighttime image or a nighttime image to a daytime image. Yeah, they're realistic images, except they don't correspond to each other. So how do we fix this? So uh, we proposed the following thing. We proposed to use a shared latent space. What does this mean? So we make the assumption that if you have an image in the first domain, <clears throat> Um, that it maps to, to a certain uh, location in the shared latent space. And what we, what we would like to happen is that if we have the same image, if we had the same image at nighttime, which we usually don't have, but if we had a paired set, we want the nighttime image to correspond to the same point in the shared latent space, right? Because then, if that's the case, if you had an encoder that would allow for this, then we could imagine having decoders that would then take this point in the shared latent space that could decode it either to a daytime or to a nighttime image, right? So the shared latent space would mean that any point in this latent space is sort of invariant to being daytime or nighttime. It encodes somehow the layout and the content of the image, but not the exact appearance, right? It, it sort of invariant to daytime or nighttime and the decoder or the encoders would be the ones sort of doing the yeah, encoding of date of or, or removing of daytime nighttime information and the decoder would be the one knowing how to make it a daytime versus a nighttime image now in theory this is great right the question is how do you actually get to it right because if you don't add any constraints which is what we yeah you know, what i uh, just mentioned earlier if you have just train again, right? It would encode the first one, uh, uh, an image, uh, say a data image from the first domain. And if we decoded it with um, the nighttime decoder, it would give us non-corresponding images, right? Because again, if we have no additional constraint, it wouldn't know how to make corresponding images. So our solution is that in order to get the shared latent space, we're gonna enforce weights near the shared latent space in both the encoder and the decoder um, to be shared. So the encoder in the, in the final layers, they share the weights between encoder one and encoder two for domain one and domain two. And for the decoder, we also share the weights in the layers near the latent space. And you can imagine those are the ones sort of that yeah, take the latent vector, the point in the latent space and sort of deal with the layout of the things and the content of the things in your image. And then the remaining layers, the blue ones here, are the ones that make it on either daytime or nighttime image. And then we can do things like that, right? We can encode our domain one image, daytime image, go into the latent space and then decode it as a nighttime image and they will correspond um, because we made sure that the weights uh, are shared. And of course, in order to train it, I can ask it things like, well, if you encode a domain one image um, it, and I decode it in a domain one, it should correspond yeah, to itself again, right? And so forth. <clears throat> so th that, that actually yeah, works quite nicely. And here are some examples. So here we go from daytime to nighttime. And again, this was trained not on paired images, but rather on two sets of, yeah, images, one daytime images and one nighttime images. And you can see that the network has learned that yeah, the sky should be dark 
uh, the road should have should be illuminated to a degree that all the cars are dark except for the taillights or headlights and it's also learned some things like there should be lights in the sky sometimes right up here uh, or here it puts a lot of lights um, in the sky because it's learned that there are some sometimes so overall it, it does actually a reasonably uh, good job here and again this is actually trained without temporal coherence but it's still yeah temporally fairly consistent actually here's another example where we go from snow to summer to winter to summer and again trained on unpaired uh, data sets and it's learned again that in the summer there is no snow so you should make the shoulder either grass or or, or paved trees have leaves right so it puts leaves on all the trees the sky shouldn't be gray but it should be blue and then <laughs> it sometimes makes some hilarious assumptions um, so for instance if you look here right here's a power line right what it learned is that well these power lines and, and the post they look a little bit like trees so it thinks well i probably should add leaves to it right which of course is not yeah really true but it's not a silly thing to have learned right trees have leaves right it looks a little bit like trees so let's put leaves on it um which is quite remarkable but it does well on uh so here the, the, the shoulder right it learned that all this snow should be gone and it removes uh, all the snow uh, and so forth so i think it, it actually is quite successful here yeah you know, one more example where we go from sun to rain and again yeah, it's learned that the sky should be gray that yeah you know, it's a little uh, a little misty that the road is wet so it learned how to make the road look wet and it's actually quite successful at it it also learned that taillights uh, sometimes glow a little bit right because there's there's a bit of the rain uh, so you can see sort of these sorry you can see these taillights here right uh, that it makes them look a little glowing again yeah quite quite successful now the one i just showed was a unimodal output so you could only output one thing and exactly one thing now yeah in follow-up work we made it multimodal still unsupervised but multimodal and, and the goal is to be able to learn to go from sort of one image say from summer to winter but do multiple different translations so here for instance we, we go from yeah, the summer image to these different yeah summer uh, so to these different winter images so it learned that in the winter it might be daytime or it might be dusk or dawn for instance uh, and so forth this is what we're trying to achieve so it's, it's very similar to unit uh, with the addition that we now assume it's a partially shared latent space and the one thing that's not shared is the style so we still have yeah this latent space that we encode into so that's sort of the class or the content i should call it the content and then we have this other space where we encode the style into <clears throat> and we try to disentangle this without labels right we're trying to disentangle this automatically then when we yeah do it at runtime we can yeah say we, we translate from big cats to house cats we can now sample you know, different styles so that when we apply them to the content we get different looking cats uh, and so that's our goal the way to do that is the following so what what we do is that we, we train the network as false so we first tell it um that given yeah an image in domain one it should be disentangled into style and content and when i put these back together uh, i should get the same image back right so not surprising and this is true for both uh, domains now but then there's another interesting um, cycle that can be we can form right so if i have <coughs> an image in domain one i or oh, uh, an image in domain two so the image in domain two if i can disentangle 
its content from its style. So let's say I disentangle its content. If I apply the style from image one, I should get an image like image two, but in the style of image one. And if I disentangle this one back, I should get back content two in style one. So I can make sure that when I do this translation from two to one, that the style remains the same and the content remains the same. And I can train it on both uh, sides. And that's sufficient as a constraint to make this work. The network itself, similar um, to before, yeah, except now we have a, this content encoder. So this encoder step, when you get to the latent space that has a content code. But in addition, now we have a style encoder that yeah, encodes the style. And the style is fed, fed back into the decoder through ADA in, which is adaptive instant normalization, which is similar to spade, um, sort of the precursor to the spade block, where it's sort of a global um, scale and bias that's being applied. Um, and then we can reconstruct an image. Right, and these are some examples. So these are examples where the ground truth is available just for uh, comparison's sake. So it, this is, goes from edges to shoes, and this is the ground truth input, and these are sample translations. And as you can see, they actually are very reasonable, right? It manages to figure out that there's different colors for the, for the outside of the shoe, but the inside remains consistent. For the sneakers, it manages to realize that there might be a pattern on them. So here it does a you know, blue-white pattern, which is, you know, make, makes sense. Here's a, a leather version, here's a white and black version. The same is true for the handbags. Given the pattern, it, it, it thinks, well, yeah, it could be a colorful pattern or mostly you know, blue and gray or just black with pattern almost invisible. So it does, it, it does learn quite a bit which is which really neat. So these sample translations are actually you know, really quite good. Then we also tried uh, going from cityscapes real images to Cynthia uh, synthetic images, and it learns that yeah, in in the data set with the synthetic images, there's rain, there's snow, uh, there's sort of nighttime, and then if you go the other way, it learns that if you go from the synthetic images to real images, that the city might look you know, sort of a little bit more cloudy, or a little less cloudy, or there might be cobblestone on the road. So again, it learns to disentangle style. We've also applied it to the summer to winter and winter to summer case. Now here, um, it, the disentanglement it found that in the winter there might be more or less snow, right? There's a lot of snow or a little bit of snow. And for the summer it figured out, well, it, it might be yeah, full summer or maybe it's early spring where there's fewer leaves uh, on the trees. Now, we can also apply this to yeah, translate from dogs to cats, uh, just as a fun experiment, and we apply it to a video. And since it's multimodal, we can interpolate in the latent space and create different types of cats, and we can have them all do the same thing. And here we're, we're translating from house cat to big cat. And then on the right side, we always go through uh, the latent space. And now we're doing big cats to house cats. And again, we're going through the latent space on the right side. So you can see how we morph through different types of cats. And here we're morphing through different types of dogs. And it does well, even, even though we're morphing between dogs who have a you know, very different type of fur. Here we're doing the inverse. We're going from dog to house cats. Again, translation is on the right. And that's it. And of course, now we can also build the whole matrix of content versus style, right? So here we have, um, again, edges to shoes, and we can have copy the style of one shoe to all other shoes and vice versa. And the same for you know, big cats to house cats, uh, which, which is quite neat if you can show the whole matrix. Right, <clears throat> so all of these required Lots of training data. Now, is it possible to do this in a few shot setting? Meaning I might have an, yeah, an input and I want to translate a new kind of animal to the same pose as your input image. So I have trained on dogs, but not on the particular dog breeds that I'm showing. Can I translate these new dog breeds somehow to the input 
both. Or I can show a completely new kind of animal, right? Um, and can I translate this new style of animal to the pose of the dog? And the same for foods here. Here we translate everything to chow mein. So we translate other foods to chow mein just as a yeah, fun, fun thing to do. Um, right. <clears throat> so yeah, again, it's, it's similar to before, right? Um, we have some, some point in an uh, X, which is of the domain, and it's encoded uh, as its content. We have a different dog. We want to take its style <clears throat> and somehow yeah, apply it, right? So that it serves this other dog that happens to look like the style of you know, the one at the bottom, but has the pose uh, of the one at the top. Now, the problem is, <clears throat> if I have, so, and, and same thing here for cats, right? That's what I want. Now, the problem is, if I haven't sampled sort of my style space enough, right? Then it's not going to work. So I need to make sure that I see sort of enough data somehow um, to make this, this work. And the way we do this is as following. So yeah, we want to cover, cover the style space. So we train on sort of a, yeah, a set of, in this case, you know, dog breeds, right? We have n different classes um, of dog breeds. And for each of them, we have a few images. And then we, we train with uh, given one of the source classes and we apply one of the other source classes as sort of the, the target you know, style. And that's how we want it to be translated, right? And the way we do this uh, is interesting. So we make sure that uh, when we do this um, translation that that um, the features of, or some of the early features of the styles is the same as some of the early features of the translated image. So it's sort of the, the, the trick that we use for the unsupervised image image translation, um, but for the, in, in the other direction, right, where we use the, <clears throat> um, again, the layers to make sure that their features are similar, um, because then we think we copy the style. Um, and that actually works yeah, remarkably uh, well. So this is how we train it. And then at inferencing time, we just give it a new content image, sorry, we give it a content image and a target class, and it can be an, a new target class, which should be somewhat similar to the ones it's seen. And then it can do a translation. The way this works is very similar um, to the one you just saw. We have a content image that can encode it into a content code. Uh, the class or the style is slightly different because we might give you one or more images as an example. And the way to make sure that all are being used, we encode you know, each one of them, but then we do average pooling um, for each of them and we take the mean and that's sort of our style or class code, which again, we feed in uh, through an ADA in um, layer. And that, and then we yeah, output it. And here, here are some examples. So. Uh, the input is the row label X, and uh, I'm showing new kinds of animals that were not in the training set. And then at the bottom, you see the translation. So here you can see we're going from uh, leopard to uh, is it a Doberman, whatever this this uh, type of dog is. And then yeah, different types of uh, animals, different dogs, different cats, uh, and so forth. And yeah, it does actually a reasonably good job. Um, Except, yeah, sometimes, um, yeah, the output is, it's, it's fairly close, right? It's actually, yeah, quite good, given that it's never seen that particular type of breed or animal. And here, uh, for birds, again, yeah, it keeps the pose of your input image, but it replaces the look with, yeah, the, uh, the style of the ones of your example images. So here yeah, it goes from yellow to black and white, and here yeah, it makes it a yellow bird and so forth. So it's, it's actually quite remarkable that it learns how to do this type of translation. And you can play with it uh, yourself. You have a web page up, um, we call it Ganimal. You can imagine what your 
your own dog might look like as different types of other animals. So here we translate them to 16 different um, other animals and you can, you can try this uh, yourself. Now, there are some limitations and, and failure cases, not surprising. Now, when the appearance of the unseen object is, is too different, right, it's not going to work, right? It doesn't know how to convert flowers to animals, right? It, it doesn't make sense and it, it can't do anything with it. There's also yeah, some other uh, failure cases where sometimes, you know, under certain circumstances, it, it fails uh, to either, yeah, translate it at all, so it might ignore the content, or it might ignore the class image, or sometimes it creates you know, hybrid images um, by accident. Overall, though, it's actually surprising how well how well this works. Now, these were all methods based on GANs, and they work really nicely. More recently, we were interested in how much sort of a standard neural network that's based, say, on ImageNet, how much does it actually know in terms of a appearance of what it's seen. And this is our paper on, on deep inversion. It's a very different way of trying to synthesize realistic looking images. So they're not actually trained specifically for this task, but it turns out that say a ResNet trained on you know, the image that data set actually memorizes a lot of information, uh, which we found is quite surprising. So you might've heard of Deep Dream, which is a Google paper from a few years back where given you know, a label say I, I want to know what dog looks like um, you give it a dog label then you back propagate through the network to f to optimize yeah a noise image that gives you the label dog so you, you start with something that doesn't give you the label dog but then you, you modify it um, until it gives you the label dog and if you do this with just noise if you start with a noisy image It'll look like a noisy image, but it gives it a label dog. There are some tricks you can play. You can do some regularization, uh, use a different um, optimizer, and you get these funky looking images that you know, get labeled as dog, but they don't, they're not realistic. So it seems like the network actually doesn't know very much about the appearance of a dog, which seems surprising, right? You would think it would know something. And here's our you know, zoomed in versions of planes, frogs, and horses. And, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine that there is a cat there or a truck, but the colors are all off and, and it doesn't seem quite right. Turns out um, it, it's missing sort of one main piece of information. And if you have that, you can actually create images that, that you know, are surprisingly realistic. So many of these models have batch norm layers, which means that at each layer, they normalize yeah, the, the mean and the variance of um, the features. And if you make sure that when you optimize for an image that gives you a particular label, then you actually get images that look very good. So here we have examples of inverting a ResNet 50 model that was trained on ImageNet. And we give it the label um, dog, for instance, or a volcano, or a burger, or bird, whale, um, uh, I think it's a pigeon, uh, ice, a polar bear, right? And they actually look like it, right? It, it's really surprising. And it also gives you quite a bit of diversity. So different flowers, right? It, it's labeled flower. We start from different random images and we optimize for an image that gives you the label flower while making sure that the image adheres to the batch norm statistics. So we make sure that it actually is in the range that the batch norm predicted. And then you get these really you know, surprisingly good looking images. Now, they're not as good as the ones created by a GAN, right? No doubt. But it is, at least we thought, interesting and surprising that you can actually create images that you can recognize even though the network was never trained specifically for this task, right? Its task was actually to do image classification. So these are prototypical images that the network thinks you know, a particular class um, might look like. And for things like pigeons, it works surprisingly well, right? That this actually looks like a pigeon, and this actually looks like a burger, and this looks like a whale, which is, which is you know, quite interesting and, and surprising. 
Right, and, and, and with this I would like to conclude. So in conclusion, uh, I've shown you yeah, a number of different uh, methods, uh, pixel pixel HD and vid to vid that goes from semantic labels to realistic images, and they were trained um, in a supervised fashion. I showed an extension called Gaugan with a different model um, that's interactive and, and yeah, works really well. Then we went to unsupervised um, and, and few shot training um, so unit, M unit, and F unit. Then finally, I showed you sort of maybe a forward-looking piece of work where yeah, we, we investigated whether just a normal neural network can actually be used for image uh, synthesis. And of course, none of this was done yeah, uh, by, just by myself, right? It's done with a large number of collaborators who I would like to thank um, for working with us uh, on all these uh, projects. And... With that, I would like to conclude my talk and, and thank you for uh, attending and I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, should there be any. So thank you. All righty, fantastic. Well, that was, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Jan, for uh, delivering it in, in our uh, modified virtual circumstances these year, this year. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in on Rocket Chat. Um, so I'll also encourage everyone to add more questions there if you have them for discussion. Um, we're running a little bit late uh, due to the earlier technical difficulties, but we'll still, we'll still get some Q&A in. Um, you know, I'm struck by this, by how kind of with traditional rendering, or maybe we should call it legacy rendering now, you know, there, there is so much success with, you know, measured materials and measured illumination, you know, kind of increasing the visual realism, you know, and in some ways, you know, learning all that stuff from the real world is just taking that all the way to the extreme and, and the results are, are quite impressive. Um, we have a question from Fabrice Roussel, uh, who asks, uh, what is the impact of the data set uh, on the algorithm output, and how do you go about curation in your team? Right, that, that's an excellent question. So of course, you know, the data set, you know, as in many machine learning techniques, uh, is everything, right? So what, what you put in has you know, really strong influence of what you get out. So if your data set isn't very good, um, clearly your results are, won't be very good either. So curating the right data set is, uh, yeah, really important. And for some examples, we took actually great care to, to make sure we curated a yeah, good data set. For instance, when we did, so when we collected dogs and cats, we made sure that yeah, they were always roughly in the same sort of, uh, the, the amount of space they took within a, an image was roughly the same. Their, yeah, the eyes are roughly in the same location. So we took care to make sure that, yeah, it's sort of a good data set that it's easy to learn from. from. So it, it is you know, an important aspect of any of these methods to make sure that the data set is you know, good and, and easy to learn from. We also have a question from Hao Shi, uh, who asks, um, do you have any thoughts about how to incorporate uh, top-down knowledge or common sense guidelines uh, to address the multimodal ambiguities? Right. So we, yeah, as you saw, we didn't really put any top-down knowledge into it, right? When we, when the work that deals with multimodal data, it doesn't actually disentangle the multimodalities at all, right? So say you translate from you know, uh, summer to winter and we have multimodal winter. Well, it could be that during the winter you have daytime and nighttime. Um, but maybe there's other attributes as well. We don't disentangle those, right? It's one big latent space and you can, or one big, one big style space that you can wander you know, in, but you don't know what the different aspects of the style space actually are. So, so we did, you know, as, as the questioner rightly points out, we, we didn't disentangle any of it. So you, you do really want to, you know, in addition, disentangle you know, your latent space further so you have more control over what you're, synthesizing. So we haven't done any any work in this um, so far, but there's definitely work by other groups who are looking at how can I disentangle you know, latent spaces so that the user has more control and this can be done yeah, in semi-automatic 
uh, where it's for instance actually style again, also from a video. The, there is yeah the, the latent space gets disentangled to a degree, um, and, and that's automatically and that, that that works actually quite nicely. I don't know if you need higher order knowledge in order to do this. If you need to infuse it for that particular problem, um, but but there are certainly problems where yeah having or being able to infuse you know some some common sense knowledge would be helpful. Um, but of course, as we all know, common sense knowledge is actually really difficult to incorporate into deep learning. Um, so, so we don't have any good ideas on how to do that, I'm afraid. For the research. Yes. Um, Tom Galuli uh, asks, do you notice any problems with mode collapse when training your models? If so, how did you deal with it? <laughs> yes, yeah, GANs. Yeah, often or can suffer from from mode collapse. You know, it's it's well known, and there's some things that, that people do, some some tricks um, that people try uh, to prevent mode collapse. We don't fully prevent it either, right? It, it just so happens that some things are probably not being represented by the GAN, which for yeah. You know, Synthesis applications, like when you synthesis, synthesize landscapes, maybe that's okay, right? Maybe it's not as problematic if we don't cover the whole space of, of your training set. We, we, we have, uh, yeah, we are contemplating whether we should look at other techniques such as VAEs that don't suffer um, from mode collapse. Um, so, so that's a possibility, right? Moving to a different method where, where, you're, where you know that mode collapse is not an issue. But with GANs, yeah, it, it is an issue. You can prevent it to a degree, but you can't guarantee that there's no mode collapse. And, and we don't guarantee it either. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, you know, which, um, so I'll, I'll ask you to, to uh, go out on a limb a little bit. Uh, and, you know, is this the end of traditional rendering? You know, are those of us who are still working on sampling algorithms, you know, barking up the wrong tree? You know, will, will future GPU in 10 years be, be based on these techniques? <laughs> yeah, even though I'm working in, in this, you know, on these techniques, I don't think they will replace traditional graphics. I think, or I hope they will supplement it um, to a degree, but I, I really don't think they will replace traditional graphics. And that, that's for a number of reasons. A is that traditional graphics is often used to create the worlds that don't exist, right? <clears throat> excuse me, it's, <clears throat> excuse me. It's difficult to learn you know, how to create worlds that don't exist if you need training data from somewhere, right? So somebody needs to create training data to create these worlds that don't exist, which really means that somebody has to create them in the first place. So yeah, th that's one reason why it won't go away. The, the second reason I think is that at least the methods now, you don't have you know, as much control as you have with traditional graphics. So I think where, where AI can come in is actually to supplement the artist's pipeline, right? Where content creation is really cumbersome and difficult and, and takes a long time. So helping artists to be more productive and, and speed up the content creation process, I think that's where AI will really play a bigger role. I don't know if, if it will, yeah, I, I don't think it will replace traditional real-time rendering though. I, I don't think, yeah. I think traditional graphics has yeah, has the right it's the right approach, right? It's the and I think it'll yeah stay. Uh, I don't think it will get re replaced. All right, well that's that's a relief. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, you know we are unfortunately at time, uh, and there are a couple more great questions in the rocket chat, which unfortunately we can't get to. Um, but thank you again for preparing this keynote and, and giving it. Um, and I'd say let's all thank the speaker, but. Uh, fortunately, you, know, you, you can get clapping icons on YouTube. Uh, it's as far as that can go. So thank you very much. Um, and this concludes our, our opening session. Thank you. Thank you so much.